Welcome everyone to the Mysteries Abound podcast. I'm your host Paul and this is episode 64. This show is entitled The Mystery of Earth's Missing Moon. And in keeping with the theme for Mysteries Outside of Our Earth, our first story comes from the newsdiscovery.com website. It's entitled Hunting for the Real Planet X and it's written by Mark Thompson. The announcement of the discovery of exoplanet Alpha Centauri B B on October 16 is a testimony to how far planetary detection techniques have come over the last few decades. It brings the total of confirmed exoplanets or extrasolar planets to a staggering 825. However, the search for planets in our own solar system has subsided since the pioneering days at the end of the 18th century with the discovery of Uranus and almost 100 years later with the identification of Neptune. The idea of another planet, dubbed Planet X, inspired astronomers to keep searching for yet another hundred years in a hunt that was full of twists and turns. The hunt for Planet X began in 1781 when British astronomer Sir William Herschel was studying stars in the constellation of Taurus and noticed one star seemed slightly fuzzy or nebulous in appearance. A few days later it seemed to have moved position. He concluded it was a comet. Further study revealed it was actually a planet, Uranus, the seventh planet in our solar system and beyond the orbit of Saturn. Detailed observations of Uranus's movement revealed an orbit that seemed to be influenced by another, even more distant object, Mathematicians studying the data predicted the position of an eighth planet before it was officially discovered. Visual confirmation of Neptune's existence was announced in 1846. Using the same techniques to study the orbital characteristics of both Uranus and Neptune revealed they were both still being tugged at by the gravitational force of another unknown object. The search for the ninth planet in the solar system began and it was American astronomer Percival Lowell who identified possible candidates. Some years after Lowell's death in 1930, Pluto was identified by Clive Tombaugh, an astronomer working at the Lowell Observatory, and was believed to be the final member of the solar system's planetary family. However, the 1978 discovery of Pluto's moon Charon reopened the Planet X debate. Through accurate measurements of Charon's orbit, the mass of Pluto could be deduced. Ultimately it showed that the ninth planet couldn't possibly have affected the orbits of Uranus and Neptune as observations appeared to show. The renewed interest in Planet X was short-lived as the Neptunian flyby by Voyager 2 in 1989 revealed its mass was less than thought. By reapplying this knowledge, it showed the outermost ice giant planets were behaving exactly as they should, and the orbital perturbations were down to observational error. It seems the myth of Planet X had finally died. This could have been the end of the Planet X saga, but recent studies of the Kuiper Belt, a region of icy minor planets located in the outermost reaches of the solar system, suggest this may not be the case. It would be reasonable to expect the millions of frozen lumps of rock would gradually decrease with the distance from the Sun, but at a distance of 48 astronomical units, beyond the orbit of Pluto, they seem to drop off suddenly at the so-called Kuiper Cliff. Maybe Planet X is responsible for this strange unexpected feature in the outer edge of our solar system, or maybe not. The Voyager and Pioneer spacecraft heading out of our solar system haven't detected any substantial planets that might cause the cliff. But space is vast. The chances of a spacecraft happening to fly past a previously undiscovered world would be highly unlikely. Also ground-based observatories and space telescopes like NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer have turned up little evidence. 
but the jury is still out. Until an answer is found for the Kuiper Cliff, the ghost of Planet X will remain as a tantalising but unlikely explanation. A 1,400-year-old vampire skeleton with metal spikes through its shoulders, heart and ankles has been discovered in Britain, a new report has claimed. The skeleton dating from 550 to 700 AD, found buried in the ancient Minster town of Southwell, Nottinghamshire, has shed light on rare vampire burials in Britain. Long dismissed as myth and legend, the vampire is associated with spooky stories. From the www.phenomenica.com website, a 1,400-year-old vampire skeleton has been discovered in Britain. It is believed to be a deviant burial, where people considered the dangerous dead, such as vampires, were interred to prevent them from rising from their graves to plague the living. Only a handful of such burials have been unearthed in the UK until now. The discovery is detailed in a new report by Matthew Beresford of Southwell Archaeology. The skeleton was found by archaeologist Charles Daniels during the original investigation of the site in Church Street, which revealed Roman remains. Beresford said when Daniels found the skeleton, he jokingly checked for fangs. Throughout the Anglo-Saxon period, the punishment of being buried in waterlogged ground face down, decapitated, staked or otherwise, was reserved for thieves, murderers or traitors, or later for those deviants who did not conform to society's rules, adulterers, disruptors of the peace, the unpious or oathbreaker, said Beresford. Which of these the Southwell deviant was, we will never know, he says. Beresford believes the remains may still be buried on the site where they originally lay because Daniels was unable to remove the body from the ground. John Locke, chairman of Southwell Archaeology, said the body was one of a handful of such burials to be found in the UK. A lot of people are interested in it, but quite where it takes us, I don't know, because this was found in the 1950s and now we don't know where the remains are, Locke said. The discovery comes five months after archaeologists found remains from a third grave in central Bulgaria linked to the practice, the report said. The skeleton was tied to the ground with four iron clamps while burning ambers were placed on top of his grave. You might think that the death of a famous person would be relatively easy to double-check before reporting it. But you would be wrong. For hundreds of years, the news has been jumping the gun on the deaths of some of our most celebrated personalities. So these eleven all had the surreal experience of reading their own obituaries. From the www.mentalfloss.com Eleven People Who Lived to Read Their Own Obituaries by Kathy Benjamin Number 1. Mark Twain 
Twain is the most famous person to have had his death reported incorrectly. But the story most of us think we know is actually a combination of two. In 1897, his cousin was dying, and a reporter mixed up his Twains. Sent an inquiry to Twain's publisher, asking if he had passed yet, but was corrected before an obituary ran. It was when retelling this story that Twain wrote his famous, though often misquoted, line, The report of my death was an exaggeration. Ten years later, Twain actually did get a premature obituary of sorts published. While he was yachting, the waters his boat was supposed to be in became rough and the air foggy. The New York Times published a piece saying it was likely that he had been lost at sea. The next day, Twain, whose boat hadn't set off yet, got to rebuff the article with one of his own. Number 2. Alfred Nobel While the story may be apocryphal, it's said that Alfred Nobel decided to start giving his famous prizes after reading about his death in the French papers. His brothers had recently died and at least one publication got confused and announced that the inventor of dynamite had passed on under the not at all subtle heading, The Merchant of Death is Dead. Since Nobel was a pacifist who hated that his discovery was killing people, he was allegedly inspired to rehabilitate his name before his real obituary ran. Number 3. Titan Leeds Benjamin Franklin decided to annoy one of his business rivals in 1733 by announcing in Poor Richard's Almanac that Titan Leeds, the producer of his own almanac, would die at 3.29pm on October 17 of that year. When Leeds didn't die and made fun of Franklin for the fact in his own almanac, Franklin decided to run an obituary for him anyway. He kept the game up for years, insisting that the real Leeds was dead and that the man calling himself Leeds had stolen his identity. This meant the real Leeds had to continue to insist he was still in fact alive until he actually did pass away five years later, at which point poor Richards ran a note congratulating the fake publisher for finally accepting that Leeds was dead. Number 4. Marcus Garvey The Jamaican politician is the only person known to have possibly been killed by their premature obituary. In 1940, Garvey suffered a stroke and his death was reported in a Chicago paper, which he happened to read. Unfortunately, the obituary was completely unflattering, saying the once-loved man had died broke, alone and unpopular. According to legend, the stress of reading about what people really thought of him was so stressful it brought on another stroke, which actually did kill him. Number 5. Ernest Hemingway After Hemingway was almost killed in a plane crash in 1954, numerous papers reported his death. Not only was the writer not bothered by this, he is said to have put together a scrapbook of all the obituaries and read them after breakfast every morning while drinking a glass of champagne. Number 6. Bill Henry Henry might not be the most famous baseball player of all time, but his career, which included 16 years in the majors and two World Series appearances, was big enough that his death made the national news. And there was no mistake this time, there was a body and everything. Bill Henry was definitely dead. This probably came as a shock to the real Bill Henry, who heard about his death on the news and after looking into it discovered that the man who had died had stolen his identity. A retired salesman had convinced everyone he was the retired baseball player, including his wife of 19 years, who said he even used to go to elementary schools and talk about his sports career. Number 7. Joe DiMaggio In 1999, the baseball great was watching a movie in his home with his friend Morris Engelberg, 
He stopped the movie to do something at almost the exact moment that an NBC news crawl announced he had just died. The crawl only ran once and a retraction was issued 20 minutes later. So it was astonishing DiMaggio had seen it live. Engelberg reported that his friend was furious at first, but calmed down when he started joking about both of them being in heaven together. Number 8. Samuel Taylor Coleridge In 1816, the famous poet was minding his own business at a hotel, enjoying a coffee, when he heard the men at the table next to him discussing his recent suicide. The paper they were reading had reported he had hanged himself. Coleridge asked to read the article and then announced who he was. In typical polite English fashion, the men were mostly concerned that they might have hurt his feelings by talking about his death in such a way. Number 9. The CNN Incident If CNN had their way, April 16, 2003 would have been one of the most tragic days in history. That day their website announced the deaths of, among others, Fidel Castro, Dick Cheney, Nelson Mandela, Bob Hope, Gerald Ford, Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan. While the sheer number of people listed as having just died should have been a clue something was wrong, the incident is also a good example of why you should always read the actual title. While the headlines may have looked accurate, the information in them was decidedly not, since most of the obituaries were just templates that borrowed text from others, specifically the late Queen Mother. And this resulted in Dick Cheney being memorialised as the UK's favourite grandmother. Number 10. Pope John Paul II the late Pope may have been the only person to have his death falsely announced three times during his lifetime. In 1981, CNN anchors referred to him repeatedly as if he was deceased after he had been shot. The same network again announced his death as part of their 2003 incident from the previous story. Finally, someone else got it wrong, although Fox was much closer. They announced the Pope was dead on his actual date of death, but they jumped the gun by several hours after failing to confirm their source's information was correct. And finally, number 11, Lal Bihari. While he may not have read an actual obituary, the falsely reported death of this Indian farmer had a bigger effect on his life than anyone else on the list. When Bihari went to apply for a bank loan in 1975, he discovered that officially he was not alive and therefore did not qualify for any money. It seemed a relative had paid off a government official to register Bihari as deceased in order to steal his farmland. Despite being very much alive and even running for public office in 1989, it took this poor farmer 19 years of activism on behalf of himself and others who had also been falsely declared deceased before he was finally declared alive again. from the www.dailycamera.com website The petrified forest's conscience rocks are returned to the park. They are called conscience rocks and there are piles of them in northern Arizona's petrified forest national park. Unlike the pet rock craze of past years, these rocks aren't keepers. The Arizona Daily Sun reports that some of the rocks were mailed back by people citing curses. Some were seized during inspections. 
Some of the stone was tossed out of car doors and windows before the visitors who took them reached the inspection station at the entrance of the park. The National Park Service estimates that about a tonne of petrified wood a month is stolen from the 220,000 acre park's 600,000 annual visitors. The estimate is based on the amount of rocks mailed back, picked up along the side of the road near the exits and seized. The rocks had once been wood, part of a large forest that existed 200 million years ago. Time and sediment had slowly turned the wood into stone quartz, preserving the tree rings and bark so the modern world could marvel at the beauty. The rocks, some pieces as big as a briefcase, others as small as a silver dollar, make a pile weighing tons. Once it's removed from the original place, the damage is done, park ranger Kip Wolf had said. There's no way to put it back where it originally came from. The stones have been taken out of their context, Wolf had said. They no longer have scientific value and are placed on the piles. There's no way to know for sure how much is taken. The park has more petrified wood than anywhere else in the world. Matthew Smith, museum technician at the park, says that the museum's collection of letters sent with conscience rocks has about 1,200 pages written between the 1930s and now. Packages dropped off at the fee collection booths at the park sometimes come with letters, but not always. He gets three to six new letters a month. The minimum fine for stealing petrified wood or pottery shards or any archaeological artefacts is $350. The price goes up the bigger the weight and quantity of the specimens, said Nick Poulos, a park law enforcement ranger. The crime is a misdemeanour. The typical response from visitors who are caught, it's just a small piece. I thought it was OK, Poulos said. About two miles from the pile of conscience rocks at the southern entrance to the park, the Rainbow Forest Museum has a display of letters from people all over the world who have returned rocks that were stolen from the park. The display is called Mystery of the Conscience Wood. Sitting on a bench is a large piece of wood. Ranger Lauren Carter says a man came into the museum with it. He had said his father had stolen it 55 years ago. He had hidden the hefty piece of petrified wood in his trunk under a sack of potatoes. There was talk of a family curse. It could be a manifestation of their guilt probably, said Carter, pointing to a three ring binder underneath the display. The binder contains letters from all over the world from people who have returned pieces of petrified wood they or family members stole from the park. Many of the letters have a theme of bad luck. Poulos says visitors may pick up the petrified wood to look at it. That's fine, as long as they put the rocks back where they found them. NASA's GRAIL mission started its lunar probe late in 2011 to uncover some of the mysteries buried beneath the surface of the Moon, even perhaps a long-lost companion. According to recent scientific speculation, the Earth once had two moons gracing our night skies. From the www.dailygalaxy.com website, Mystery of the Earth's missing moon. Will NASA solve it? It's an intriguing idea, said David Smith, Grail's deputy principal investigator at MIT. And it would be a way to explain one of the great perplexities of the Earth-Moon system. The Moon's strangely asymmetrical nature. Its near and far sides are substantially different. Scientists agree that when a Mars-sized object crashed into our planet about four billion years ago, the resulting debris cloud coalesced to form the Moon. Jutsi and Asfaug posit that the debris cloud actually formed two moons. 
a smaller chunk of debris landed in just the right orbit to lead or follow the bigger moon around Earth. Normally such moons accrete into a single body shortly after formation, explains Smith. But the new theory proposes that the second moon ended up at one of the Lagrange points in the Earth-Moon system. Lagrange points are a bit like gravitational flytraps. They can hold an object for a long time, but not necessarily forever. The second moon eventually worked its way out and collided with its bigger sister. The collision occurred at such a low velocity that the impact did not form a crater. Instead, the smaller moon went splat, forming the contemporary far side highlands. In short, the lunar highlands are the lost moon's remains. Flying in formation around the moon, NASA's Twin Grail spacecraft makes precise measurements of the lunar gravitational field. By probing the moon's gravity field, Grail sees inside the moon, illuminating the differences between the near and far sides. Grail's twin spacecraft have moved around the moon for several months, while a microwave ranging system precisely measures the distance between the two spacecraft. By watching that distance expand and contract as the pair fly over the lunar surface, researchers map the moon's underlying gravity field. These measurements tell us a lot about the distribution of material inside the moon and give us pretty definitive information about the differences in the two sides of the moon's crust and mantle. If the density of crustal material on the lunar far side differs from that on the near side in a particular way, the finding will lend support to the two moon theory. But this information is just one piece of the jigsaw puzzle. To prove a sister moon ever existed, other pieces are needed. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has already provided key information on the moon's surface topography. Scientists can also refer to lunar surface chemistry data and look at old seismic information from Apollo for clues. But what's really needed, said Smith, is a sample return mission to the far side to determine the age of rocks there. The smaller moon, if there was one, was about one third the size of our current moon. So upon collision, it would have cooled down faster and the rocks on the far side, where its remains are thought to have spread, would be older than the ones on the near side. The Scandinavian folklore consists of a huge variety of creatures, good or evil, which have frightened people for centuries. They were often meant to scare children, but even today they are essential and important to the modern northern society. In the 1890s, something changed in the way common Scandinavians saw themselves and their culture. They looked back in time to rediscover their old myths and legends folklore which had been forgotten because of the coming of Christianity. It was a time when people feared nature because we were becoming more industrialised. The forests, the mountains and the sea, it all seemed strange, dark and magic. And because of that we are now left with evil spirits and monsters who used to represent our way of seeing nature. From the listverse.com 10 Creatures in Scandinavian Folklore and it's by Rebecca Winther Sorensen and if you live in Scandinavia please excuse my poor pronunciations Number 10 Huldra Huldra is a troll-like woman living in the woods She is fair and beautiful 
but wild and has a long cowtail, which she hides behind her back upon meeting a human. It is said that Adam and Eve had many children, and that one day when Eve was giving her children a bath, God came to visit. Eve had not finished bathing all of her children, and so hid those who were still dirty. God asked, Are there not more children? And when Eve said no, God said, Then let all that is hidden remain hidden, and the hidden children became der under your disk, the ones living underground. Lost souls who live under the surface of the earth, calling for someone to be with them, usually human passerbys. Huldra was one of them, but somehow she remained above the ground. She is a flirtatious young girl who is neither good nor evil. Number 9. Nyssa These beings are actually still very important in the modern society. In the Scandinavian Christmas tradition, there is no Santa in the shape of a fat bearded guy who lives at the North Pole. Instead, we each have our own Nis living in the barn. That is to say, if you are a farmer or living in the countryside, who is like a guardian for the household. These creatures are typical pranksters, but can easily be befriended, and around Christmas they have the same function as Santa in Western traditions. Number 8. Dwarves and Elves Made famous by J.R.R. Tolkien, the dwarves and the elves originate from Norse mythology. The dwarves lived in their own part of Midgard, a place no human could find. They were small people, often pictured as little men with long beards, who were master smiths and made the swords, shields and armour for the gods themselves. The elves lived in a deep forest nearby the castle of Froy, the god of fertility called Alfheim. They were fair and beautiful and commonly seen as peaceful creatures. Number 7. Mare Mare is a female vet which gives people bad dreams at night by sitting on them in their sleep. She is a common belief in Germanic folklore and appears in many different shapes. The Scandinavian words for nightmare are Norwegian, melit, Danish, meid, Swedish, madrum, which directly translated means mere ride and mere dream. Number 6. Fosgrimmen. Fosgrimmen, or just grim, Fos is Norwegian for waterfall, is a water creature. He is a young, handsome man who sits naked under waterfalls, playing the fiddle. He plays the music of nature itself, the sound of the water, the wind in the trees. It all comes from his music. He is said to teach humans how to play if they secretly brought him a piece of stolen meat. Torgia Orgunsen, better known as Myla Gutten, was a famous fiddle player from Telemark, Norway, who was so good it was rumoured he had sold his soul in exchange for Fosgrimmen's skills. Number 5. Troll The troll comes from Norse mythology, inspired by the cruel giants, who were the main enemies of the gods, who lived in the mountains of Utgard. They have a human-like appearance, but they are incredibly ugly and huge, and every story about them tells of how stupid they are. In the old tales there were trolls of all kinds, some living in the high mountains, in castles carved out of the stone, in deep forests, and some even by the shore. Upon the arrival of Christianity around the 1300s, the stories changed. The trolls were able to smell the blood of a Christian man, and basically they stood for anything of the old times, which the new religion condemned. Oh, and if they ever came in contact with sunlight, they turned to stone. Number 4. Pesta. The Black Death was a tragedy for all of the Scandinavian countries. Denmark lost one third of its population, while Norway lost half. The plague was so devastating that people soon made it into a character of its own. Pesta comes as the figure of death and illness, 
in the shape of a hideous old woman dressed in black, carrying a broom and a rake. She travelled from farm to farm, spreading the plague. If she carried with her rake, some of the inhabitants would survive. But if she was carrying the broom, everyone in the family would soon die. It is still common to mention Pesta in the context of disease and illness. Number three, Nokon. Nokon is a mysterious water creature residing in fresh water, lakes and deep ponds. He is in Norwegian tradition described as a dark monster with his eyes just above the surface, watching as people walk by. In Swedish tradition, he is a beautiful young man, tricking women into jumping into the water and then drowning them. He is a shapeshifter and can change into a white horse, letting young children ride on his back and then jumping with them back into his pond. He is also said to be a talented musician, playing the violin so that the villagers can hear him at night. There were ways to protect oneself from him. You could throw a piece of metal into the water, like a needle or an iron cross, and so save yourself. If he had already attacked, you could overpower him by saying his name. You could also say a riddle for protection, and the English translation is, Needle in the water, the Virgin Mary threw steel in the water. You are sinking. I float. Number two, Draugen. Draugen from Norse Draugr meaning ghost, yet another water creature. And this one is something you really wouldn't want to meet when you're out in your boat. Draugen is the ghost of a man who died at sea. He is huge and monster-like and covered in seaweed, rowing in half a boat. He erupts a terrible scream when he appears, and legend has it he can be seen during stormy nights at sea, drowning sailors and fishermen, and sinking their boats and ships. This is the story of a man who once ran from Draugen and into a churchyard, where he shouted for the spirits of the dead to protect him. The day after, all the graves were open, and the churchyard was covered in seaweed. In these days, Draugen is commonly associated with anything dark and mystical about the sea. And finally, number one, the Kraken. Kraken is probably a creature most people will recognise. It's been used in several movies like Pirates of the Caribbean and Clash of the Titans. But originally the Kraken belongs in the cold Norwegian sea where it was first said to be seen in the early 1700s. The first detailed description was made by the Danish writer and biologist Erik Pontoppidan in 1752. In old times the kraken was said to be in the shape of a huge crab the size of an island, and many sailors and fishermen found themselves stranded on an island that had not been there minutes before. Later descriptions tell of a monster in the shape of an enormous octopus which dragged ships down to the bottom of the sea. And whilst we're in the mood to do a bit of counting, from the www.mentalfloss.com, five of the most bizarre auctions in history. Looking for a bargain on Roman soldiers and carrier pigeons? Fire up the time machine and hit these auctions. Number one, Ronald Reagan's blood. In May 2012, a collector put a sample of Ronald Reagan's blood on the auction block. What might seem sacrilegious to some made perfect sense to him. I was a real fan of Reaganomics and felt that President Reagan himself would rather see me sell it. For his part, the Gipper hadn't expected his blood work to trickle down. The lab sample had come from the President's hospitalisation after a 1981 assassination attempt and his family hadn't authorised the release. 
Although the seller initially offered the item to the Reagan National Library, where the institution declined to purchase it, the vial wound up at public auction. The listings highlight a quarter-inch ring of blood residue at the end of the inserted rubber stopper. Demand was high. Bidding on the vial hit $30,086 before the public outcry persuaded the seller to donate his find to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. We are grateful to the current custodian of the vial for this generous donation, a spokesman said, particularly since it will keep President Reagan's blood remains out of public hands. Number two, 180,000 mummified cats. The accidental 1889 discovery of a massive cat burial site in Egypt's ancient Beni Hassan cemetery was not a high point in archaeological preservation. The mummified felines, estimated to be 3,000 to 4,000 years old, had once been bred and embalmed as four-legged offerings to the gods. Modern times proved less reverential. The local urchins who discovered the mummies staged mock cat fights in the street, sending fur and bandages flying. The Liverpool auction firm James Gordon and Company saw a more practical use for the relics. It shipped 180,000 of the cats to Britain to sell, with the thought that more might follow. Sadly, the February 10, 1890 auction quickly devolved into farce as the gift-wrapped kitties crumbled in people's hands. As the Bristol Mercury drolly reported, some amusement was evoked over the sale of the hind quarters of a cat. That particular relic fetched five shillings. Needless to say, the overall sale was not a success. Most of the felines were sold for fertiliser, or fur to Liza, as the British press dubbed it. One lot was unloaded for just six pounds a tonne, and according to reports, the auctioneer unceremoniously gaveled the sale using one of the cat's heads as a hammer. Number three, the world's rarest library. On August 10, 1840, the small Belgian town of Binch was the only place for a book collector to be. Auction catalogues announced the sale of the collection of the late Count J.N.A. de Forsas, a man who collected only books so rare that no other copies existed. If he discovered another copy, he'd dispose of his, even penning destroyed into his ledger. At just 52 volumes, his library was minuscule and priceless. As the auction date drew near, bibliophiles poured into Binch, eagerly seeking such catalogue listings as a volume on phallic hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt and a lost tome of 14th century Flemish songs. A princess allegedly sent an agent to pay any price for an embarrassing volume. But come auction time, a problem arose. No one could find the auction. In fact, nobody in town had heard of the late Count. Before long, the truth dawned on the buyers. They'd been had by Renier Chalon, a mischievous French antiquarian, who had baited them with titles he knew they couldn't resist. In a touch Chalon would appreciate, the Forsars catalogue is now a prized collectible, with one copy fetching $1,320 in a 2005 auction. Number four, military pigeons, gently used. On December 25, 1901, a New York Times headline announced, The Navy Pigeons to Go, before explaining 55 birds at the Brooklyn Yard will be sold on Monday next. For years, the Navy had been using message-carrying homing pigeons from ship-to-shore communication. But with the advent of the Marconi Wireless, Navy posts around the country started selling off their flocks. Unfortunately, there was one detail the Navy hadn't thought through. The homing pigeons were trained to fly back to the shipyard from wherever they took off, making the birds significantly less useful to anyone who was not the Navy. 
at the Norfolk Navy Yard, 150 birds, which had originally cost $8 each, went for just $30 total for trap shooting purposes. Oddly enough, the Navy had jumped the gun on retiring its winged troops. Pigeons still worked in conditions that overwhelmed primitive Marconi wireless sets. As a result, Allies continued to deploy hundreds of thousands of birds during both world wars, with the only Nazi defence being pigeon-eating falcons. And number five, the entire Roman Empire. 193 CE began promisingly for Rome. A new emperor, Pertinax, was set out to reform his notoriously corrupt bodyguards, the Praetorian Guard. The guard's response? Impaling his head atop a spear. Then the Praetorians hit upon a better and more lucrative succession scheme, auctioning the throne. Only two men had the nerve to bid for it. In the end, the politician Didius Julianus won the seat with a last-minute offer. 25,000 sesterces apiece, enough for a new horse, for each of the 10,000-plus guards. As the delighted new emperor took his empire for a spin, dallying at the theatre and throwing elaborate feasts, outrage grew over news of the auction. Governors and senators plotted against him, and citizens protested. Roman consul Cassius Dio recorded the inevitable result. Julianus came to be slain as he was reclining in the palace itself. He only had time to say, Why, what harm have I done? Whom have I killed? The unlucky emperor had reigned for a little more than two months. As they said in Rome, caveat emptor. And from the www.yourghoststories.com An article by Trident07 from South Africa The events that made me realise we're not alone Growing up I had experiences with spirits here and there It seemed as if someone made me aware of the fact that someone had died in a place or if someone told me they had experienced something in a room or house I became very aware. For the first few months that we lived in our current house, I was blissfully unaware of anything going on. However, I think Gran chose things that way. My first inkling that something was going on in the house was when we went dancing one Friday night. My dad and my husband at the time were the last ones to leave the house, so they were in charge of locking up. When we got home after midnight, Neither of them had the keys to the house. We searched the car. No luck. Searched the yard. Came up empty. Eventually my dad helped my husband onto the roof of the house and he moved tiles on the roof and we went into the house through the ceiling. He opened up from the inside with the spare keys and we then proceeded to grab flashlights and search the yard and street for the keys. We went through the entire interior of the house as well. They were missing. Around 2am we gave up and went to bed. My dad said it could be very likely that the keys fell out of the car at the dance. The next morning, when my dad woke up, the bunch of keys that we had been looking for lay on his bedside table, about an inch from his face. He could not believe it. Then came the experience with the alarm system going off while attempting to watch the ring. At this point I started wondering if there was something going on in this house. My dad had bought one of those home gym machines that he set up in the front lounge. I loved it. One night he was struggling to sleep. He was lying in bed when he heard the distinct sound of the weights of the machine being moved around. 
He opened the bedroom door and stood and listened. The weights were still making noises. He said it sounded like someone was stacking them onto a barbell rod, ready to lift them. The noises stopped when he reached the dining room and he could see the gym. A few weeks later, Mum and Dad were alone in the house. They were busy in the kitchen doing dishes when they suddenly heard talking coming from the TV room. Mum said Dad jumped a metre into the air. He got such a fright. Dad, of course, denies this. When they went to investigate, they found the TV on, playing a DVD we had been watching the night before. Neither of them had been close to the TV or the DVD player, but they were both turned on. I was living in the granny flat around this time, and my bedroom shared a wall with my parents' kitchen. Every now and then I would hear the tumble dryer. That distinct sound when you have something like jeans in the dryer, and every time a button hits the side of the dryer, it makes a muffled ding in the machine. I assumed someone was busy in the kitchen. One morning I thought I would take some of my stuff and throw it in as well, but when I left the flat and walked into Mum's kitchen, the machine was off. I touched it. No heat. Opened it. No clothes. And no one was in the house. So I thought maybe I was hearing things, and I went back to the flat, only to get to the bedroom and, once again, hear the tumble dryer going. If you sit in the TV room and a hailstorm hits, you can hear the sounds of footsteps running past the jacuzzi area. Mum used the spare room, now the boys' room, to sit and do her makeup. The room gets full sun from the front, so the lighting is great. She had her vanity against the window, so the bedroom door was right behind her, always reflected in the mirror. And she would frequently tell me that whilst sitting there, she would catch the reflection of a dark shadow in the mirror. It would walk past the door and disappear. This only happened when she was alone in the house. The same thing would happen if she or I sat alone in the TV room. We would frequently catch a shadow out of the corner of our eye, going past the jacuzzi. I also had a feeling that one of my boys was watching me from around one of the corners, but neither of them ever jumped out when I had these feelings. One night the boys and I were home alone. This was in early October this year, and it had been one of those rainy evenings. The house felt a bit stuffy, so we opened one of the windows that overlooks the jacuzzi. I have lacy orange curtains over those windows. Every so often a gust of wind would come blowing through the window and lift the curtain a little, then subside and the curtain would fall into place. My eyes were drawn to this every time the curtain moved. At one point I went to the kitchen for something and as I walked past the window I closed it. Getting what I wanted I went back to the TV and as I sat watching the curtain it lifted up as if a gust was blowing through again. I thought maybe I did not close the window properly. Therefore I got up and went to check. The window was shut. As I just sat down again, the curtain lifted again, this time higher than before. I was looking at it, and it slowly went back into place. My heart was racing and I felt a bit numb. But after that, the curtain remained in place. We have also sat and watched TV and the channel suddenly flipped. And this was not the TV channel, it was the satellite channel. I have now discovered that the TV going on and changing channels is Charlie being mischievous. It was also him who played with the weights in the gym. However, I had suspected that. I do not know where the tumble dryer incident came into play, and Gran had taken the keys the night we went dancing. One of the men had left the gate open, keys still in the lock, and Gran had made sure the house was safe. Kiddo is the one looking at me from around the corner, and he is the one running past the jacuzzi when it hails. Tim told me I have to remember that he is still, essentially, a little boy. Even he gets scared. On a side note, my mum had gone to visit a friend of hers on Saturday. I spoke to Tim and asked him if Grant had gone with her, and he asked me why I wanted to know. I told him her room does not feel as welcoming as it usually does. He laughed and said I was right, and that Mum would most likely have felt that she was with her. When I asked Mum on Sunday, she said yes. She said she felt she was not alone. Then I told her for no apparent reason that she is protected. 
She would always be safe because her mother loves her very much. And right then two things happened. I got a message from Tim simply stating, did, does and always will. In addition I had the distinct feeling that my gran had laid her hand on my right arm. My mum started to cry. And from the www.creepypasta.com website. The story, Tulpa. Last year I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local paper looking for imaginative people, looking to make good money, and since it was the only ad that week that I was remotely qualified for, I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me that all I would have to do is stay in a room, alone, with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there, I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. It seemed easy enough, and I agreed to do it as soon as they told me how much I would be paid. And the next day I began. They brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed, then attached sensors to my head and hooked them into a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualising my double again, and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I should visualise my double moving around, or try to interact with him and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room. I had trouble with it for the first few days. It was more controlled than any sort of daydreaming I'd done before. I'd imagine my double for a few minutes, then grow distracted. But by the fourth day, I could manage to keep him present for the entire six hours. They told me I was doing very well. The second week, they gave me a different room with wall-mounted speakers. They told me they wanted to see if I could keep the tulpa with me in spite of distracting stimuli. The music was discordant, ugly and unsettling and it made the process a little more difficult, but I managed nonetheless. The next week they played even more unsettling music, punctuated with shrieks, feedback loops, what sounded like an old school modem dialing up, and guttural voices speaking in some foreign language. I just laughed it off, I was a pro by then. After about a month I started to get bored. To liven things up I started interacting with my doppelganger, We'd have conversations, or play rock, paper, scissors, or I'd imagine him juggling, or breakdancing, or whatever caught my fancy. I asked researchers if my foolishness would adversely affect their study, but they encouraged me. So we played and communicated, and that was fun for a while, and then it got a little strange. I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. I'd said my date was wearing a yellow top, he told me it was a green one. I thought about it for a second and realised he was right. It creeped me out. And after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You knew on some level that you were wrong, and you subconsciously corrected yourself. What had been creepy was suddenly cool. I was talking to my subconscious. It took some practice, but I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books I'd read once years before, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. It was awesome. That was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it almost seemed odd not to see him. So whenever I was bored, I'd visualise my double. Eventually I started doing it almost all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I imagined him when I was hanging out with friends or visiting my mum. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak aloud to him, so I was able to carry out conversations with him and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything that I'd forgotten, he also seemed more in touch with me than I did at times. 
He had an uncanny grasp of the minutiae of body language that I didn't even realise I was picking up on. For example, I thought the date I'd brought him along on was going badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing a little too hard at my jokes and leaning towards me as I spoke, and a bunch of other subtle clues I wasn't consciously picking up on. I listened and let's just say that the date went very well. By the time I'd been at the research centre for four months, he was with me constantly. The researchers approached me one day after my shift and asked me if I'd stopped visualising him. I denied it, and they seemed pleased. I silently asked my double if he knew what prompted that, but he just shrugged it off. So did I. I withdrew a little from the world at that point. I was having trouble relating to people. It seemed to me that they were so confused and unsure of themselves while I had a manifestation of myself to confer with. It made socialising awkward. Nobody else seemed aware of the reasons behind their actions, why some things made them mad and others made them laugh. They didn't know what moved them, but I did, or at least I could ask myself and get an answer. A friend confronted me one evening. He pounded at the door until I answered it and came in fuming and swearing up a storm. You haven't answered me when I called you in effing weeks, he yelled. What's your effing problem? I was about to apologise to him and probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night, but my tulpa grew suddenly furious. Hit him, it said, and before I knew what I was doing, I had. I heard his nose break, he fell to the floor and came up swinging, and we beat each other up and down my apartment. I was more furious then than I had ever been, and I was not merciful. I knocked him to the ground and gave him two savage kicks to the ribs, and that was when he fled, lurched over and sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later, but I told them that he had been the instigator, and since he wasn't around to refute me, they let me off with a warning. My tulpa was grinning the entire time. We spent the night crowing about my victory and sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning when I was checking out my black eye and cut lip in the mirror that I remembered what had set me off. My double was the one who'd grown furious, not me. I'd been feeling guilty and a little ashamed, but he'd goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course, and knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone else, he told me, and I felt my skin crawl. I explained all this to the researchers who employed me, but they just laughed it off. You can't be scared of something that you're imagining, one told me. My double stood beside him and nodded his head, then smirked at me. I tried to take their words to heart, but over the next few days I found myself growing more and more anxious around my tulpa, and it seemed that he was changing. He was looking taller and more menacing. His eyes twinkled with mischief, and I saw malice in his constant smile. No job was worth losing my mind over, I decided. If he was out of control, I'd put him down. I was so used to him at that point that visualising him was an automatic process. So I started trying my damnedest to not visualise him. It took a few days, but it started to work somewhat. I could get rid of him for hours at a time. But every time he came back, he seemed worse. His skin seemed ashen, his teeth more pointed. He hissed and gibbered and threatened and swore. The discordant music I'd been listening to for months seemed to accompany him everywhere, even when I was at home. I'd relax and slip up, no longer concentrating on not seeing him, and there he'd be, and that howling noise with him. I was still visiting the research centre and spending my six hours there. I needed the money, and I thought they weren't aware that I was now actively not visualising my tulpa. I was wrong. After my shift one day, about five and a half months in, two impressively men grabbed and restrained me and someone in a lab coat jabbed a hypodermic needle into me. I woke up from my stupor back in the room, strapped into the bed, music blaring with my doppelganger standing over me cackling. He hardly looked human anymore. His features were twisted, his eyes were sunken in their sockets and filmed over like a corpse's. He was much taller than me, but hunched over, 
his hands were twisted, and the fingernails were like talons. He was, in short, effing terrifying. I tried to will him away, but I couldn't just seem to concentrate. He giggled and tapped the IV in my arm. I thrashed in my restraints as best I could, but could hardly move at all. They're pumping you full of the good stuff, I think. How's the mind? All fuzzy? He leaned closer and closer as he spoke. I gagged. His breath smelt like spoiled meat. I tried to focus, but couldn't banish him. The next few weeks were terrible. Every so often, someone in a doctor's coat would come in and inject me with something, or force feed me a pill. They kept me dizzy and unfocused, and sometimes left me hallucinating or delusional. My thought form was still present, constantly mocking. He interacted with, or perhaps caused, my delusions. I hallucinated that my mother was there, scolding me, and then he cut her throat and her blood showered me. It was so real that I could taste it. The doctors never spoke to me. I begged at times, screamed, hurled invectives, demanded answers. They never spoke to me. They may have talked to my tulpa, my personal monster. I'm not sure. I was so doped and confused that it may have just been more delusion, but I remember them talking with him. I grew convinced that he was the real one, and I was the thought form. He encouraged that line of thought at times, mocked me at others. Another thing that I pray was a delusion. He could touch me. More than that, he could hurt me. He'd poke and prod me as if he felt I wasn't paying him enough attention. Once he grabbed my testicles and squeezed until I told him I loved him. Another time he slashed my forearm with one of his talons. I still have a scar. Most days I can convince myself that I injured myself and just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. Then one day, while he was telling me a story about how he was going to gut everyone I loved, starting with my sister, he paused. A querulous look crossed his face and reached out and touched my head, like my mother used to do when I was feverish. He stayed still for a long moment and then smiled. All thoughts are creative, he told me. Then he walked out of the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and passed out. I awoke unrestrained. Shaking, I made my way to the door and found it unlocked. I walked out into the empty hallway and then ran. I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. There I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually, I don't remember how. I locked the door and shoved a dresser against it, took a long shower and slept for a day and a half. Nobody came in for me in the night, and nobody came the next day, or the one after that. It was over. I'd spend a week locked in that room, but it felt like a century. I'd withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody had even known I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The research centre was empty when they searched it. The paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given them were aliases. Even the money I'd received was apparently untraceable. I recovered as much as one can. I don't leave the house much, and I have panic attacks when I do. I cry a lot. I don't sleep much, and my nightmares are terrible. It's over, I tell myself. I survived. I used the concentration those bastards taught me to convince myself. It works sometimes. Not today, though. Three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. There's been a tragedy. My sister's the latest victim in a spree of killings, the police say. The perpetrator mugs his victims, then guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was as lovely a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. I was a little distracted, though. All I could hear was music coming from somewhere distant. Discordant, unsettling stuff that sounds like feedback and shrieking, and a modem dialing up. I hear it still, a little louder now.
The bandwidth for today's podcast was provided by TalkShoe, www.talkshoe.com. The music came from the musicalley.com website. And the show notes are kept at the Origins podcast website, www.origins.info. And before I head off, just a shout out to my friend Peter and his brother who live in Galway in Ireland. I might get a chance to see you next year with a bit of luck. So until next time, everyone, whether it be the Origins podcast or another Mysteries Abound, this is Paul saying bye for now and keep well, everyone.